I'd like to thank Calm, the number one wellness app for supporting my podcast. Improve your focus with Calm's curated music tracks and drift off to dreamland with Calm's imaginative sleep stories. Just go to calm.com slash gold. And for a limited time, you can get 40% off your Calm premium subscription with hundreds of hours of programming unlimited access to Calm's entire library and new content that's added every week. You know, listeners to my podcast have likely been anticipating today's podcast all week. And, you know, it's been a busy week for me, which is why I've waited so long to grab the mic. But investors have also been highly anticipating Fed Chair Jerome Powell's speech today at the Jackson Hole Symposium this time taking place virtually the same way they did it last time. Normally, it is in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, but people were just as excited to hear this virtual speech as they typically are to hear the ones that are delivered personally. And what everybody was anticipating was a hawkish speech. In fact, Powell was supposed to use Jackson Hole to basically unveil the taper, because up until now, the taper had simply been talked to in hypothetics. I mean, we've talked about a taper or Fed officials have talked about a taper. In fact, during the course of the week, several other Fed presidents had been interviewed and had talked about their preference for a fall taper. They said that they think taper should start in the fall, although the form that the taper would take was still up in the air. At least there were some Fed guys that said they wanted it to start right now. So the expectation was that Powell would echo those sentiments, but also put a little teeth in it by clarifying exactly what taper would entail. Because as of now, nobody really knows. The Fed is currently monetizing $120 billion of debt every month. And the taper involves a reduction in those purchases. It doesn't mean they stop the purchases. So QE continues. It just continues at a decelerated rate. And so what nobody knows, including when the taper is actually going to start, is how it's going to play out in the market. So in other words, if they're buying $120 billion a month now, How much will they buy after the first taper? Will they reduce it by 5 billion, 10 billion, 15 billion? Nobody knows. And then how long will that reduction be in effect before the next taper happens? So in other words, if they go from 120 billion a month to 110 billion a month, how long are they going to stay at 110 billion a month before they go to 100 billion a month? I mean, is there a set timetable? Is it all data dependent? And one of the reasons why it's so important to understand the timetable for the taper and for QE eventually being wound down to zero is that everybody on the Fed, including Powell today, has made it perfectly clear that the first rate hike will not start until the taper ends and there's no more QE. Think about that. The Fed is basically assuring the markets that interest rates are going to stay at zero until the Fed stops doing quantitative easing. And we have no idea how long it's going to take before they ever end their QE program, if they ever end their QE program. Why is the Fed doing that? I mean, if the Fed intended to raise interest rates, if they thought the economy was strong enough for a rate hike, which they clearly do, given what they're saying about the economy and that rates are at zero right now. It's not like they're just low. They are at zero. And if the Fed actually intended to raise interest rates, it would already be raising them. The fact that they're pretending that they're not going to raise them until some point in the future, once they finished their QE program, to me, says that the Fed knows that they're never going to raise interest rates. After all, even if the Fed thinks that high interest rates 
are not appropriate, how can they believe that 0% interest rates are appropriate? They've already admitted that inflation is at least at their mandate. They won't concede that it's well above their mandate, but they're admitting that inflation is around 2%. Even though it's ridiculously above 2%, they're claiming some kind of victory and they think it's at 2%. They're saying unemployment is not quite as low as they would like. We don't have full employment, but we still have historically low unemployment, right? If you believe the government numbers. So given the GDP growth rate, we got GDP numbers that came out earlier this week, pretty much in line with expectations. GDP in the second quarter grew by 6.6%. And personal consumption expenditures year over year increased by 11.9%. So you would consider with all of these facts, the Fed would at least raise interest rates above zero. I mean, remember, the lowest interest rates ever got during the depths of the Great Recession that happened following the 2008 financial crisis. The lowest rates got was 1%. They never went below 1%, yet now rates are still at zero. And if the economy is strong enough right, to taper, if the economy is as strong as Powell and everybody claims, why is it too weak to allow interest rates to rise to the same low level that they were slashed to during the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression? Does Powell really believe the U.S. economy is weaker today than it was during the Great Recession? Of course not. It's not that the economy is weaker. It's that the economy is even more dependent now on low interest rates than it was then. In other words, the economic bubble is much greater today than it was in 2008. And so a rate as low as 1% today is too high. Even a 1% rate would prick this bubble. Whereas back then, 1% was adding air to the bubble. Today, 1% would deflate the bubble. And I think the Fed knows that. In fact, the main reason the housing bubble got so big and the global financial crisis was so large was because the Fed waited too long to normalize interest rates. Now, I was one of the few people who was pointing this out in real time But after the collapse, you know, we got a lot of Monday morning quarterbacks in the mainstream, and it's now generally accepted that the Fed waited too long to normalize interest rates. Well, the problem is now they're waiting even longer. In fact, they're not even normalizing interest rates. The last time the Fed tried to raise rates, it didn't even come close to getting normal. And now they're not even trying because they're leaving them at zero indefinitely. And so if the Fed created such an enormous problem back in the 2000s because it was too slow in returning rates to normal. Think of the enormity of the problems that are being created now when the Fed isn't even trying to raise interest rates back to normal. In fact, it's not even trying to raise interest rates at all, and it's leaving them at zero, which is lower than they were at any point prior to the housing bubble because, again, the lowest the Fed got was one, and now we won't even raise interest rates to one. In fact, the only reason that the Fed would be willing to make this all or nothing bet on inflation being transitory is if they know the bet is already lost. And what I mean by that is the Fed realizes that raising rates now is a catastrophe. If they raise rates at all above 0%, they will set off a financial crisis. And I think that crisis would be even worse than the one that they set off in 2008. So knowing this, the Fed can't raise rates, so it has to keep coming up with excuses as to why it's not. And one of the excuses is, well, we have to wait until we finish winding down QE. The other excuse is that inflation is transitory. They can't admit that inflation is not transitory, that it's here to stay, or that it's gonna get worse, because if they admit that, then they have to do something about it because every Fed official keeps saying, well, if it ever turns out that we're wrong, if we see some evidence that inflation is not transitory, well, then, of course, we'll fight it. But since we haven't seen any of that evidence, and of course, the only reason they don't see it is because they're blind to it, 
But they're saying since there is no evidence that inflation isn't transitory, well, then we don't have to do anything. But do you leave rates at zero? I mean, why not take out the slightest bit of insurance? I mean, just in case, even if you're right, even if inflation is transitory, why not nudge rates up to 25 basis points or 50 basis points? Just do a little bit to be on the safe side, even though that wouldn't be safe. To me, that's still recklessly loose. But the fact that they're leaving it at zero, that's how scared they are to raise rates because they know if they raise rates, the house of cards is going to collapse. But here's the thing. If they know raising rates will cause a financial crisis now, why would they ever raise rates later? Because the later they wait to raise interest rates, the bigger the crisis we get when they eventually raise them. The Fed has got to know that. And so in my mind, what the Fed has realized is that, you know, we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't. If we raise rates now, we create a crisis. If we raise rates later, we create an even greater crisis. But we don't care about the crisis being greater. All we care about is that it happens later. That is the only goal that the Fed has is to delay the crisis as long as possible, because as long as crisis is inevitable, then just delay it. And that is exactly what they're doing by pretending inflation is transitory. And to a lesser extent, that's what they're doing by pretending that at some point in the future, they're actually going to raise rates when they really have no intention of doing that at all. And in fact, today's speech should have proved that because as I stated from the beginning, everybody was anticipating this speech because it was supposedly going to be hawkish where we're going to get some details on the taper. Not only that the taper was going to start in the fall, but how? What form would it take? That's what the markets have been expecting. In fact, not just this week, they've been anticipating this speech all month, if not longer. And instead of getting this hawkish speech introducing the taper, this was the most dovish speech that Powell could have possibly delivered. In fact, the word taper wasn't even spoken once. In fact, there was only one line in the entire speech that referred to the potential for a reduction in asset purchases. And the only thing that Powell said was that a reduction in the asset purchases this year could be appropriate. That's all he said. He didn't say that it would be appropriate or that it is appropriate now. He simply said that it could be appropriate, which also means it might not be appropriate. We don't know yet. It just could be. It's a possibility the Fed wants to wait for data. In other words, if the Fed really intended at this moment in time to taper, Powell had every opportunity to clarify that intention today. In fact, the markets expected it. In fact, they were blessing it. The markets seemed to be ready for it and basically giving Powell the okay to do it, yet he was still too chicken to actually say that he was going to do it. So he's still leaving his options open and just talking in general terms about the possibility of a taper before the end of the year. So nothing that the markets were expecting actually happened during this speech. In fact, most of the speech was devoted to Powell trying to convince everybody that inflation is transitory. He isn't the least bit concerned that what we are seeing is protracted. He has no concerns whatsoever. He is so confident, right, apparently, that what we're seeing is transitory, that again, he's all in. He is willing to bet everything on inflation being transitory because all he talks about is how bad it might be if the Fed were to preemptively fight off transitory inflation that turns out not to be transitory. That's what he's afraid of, cutting off the recovery too soon. But nowhere does he ever express his concern over being too late, over underestimating the strength of inflation and what that might entail for the economy. He never even raises that. I mean, now of all times, we should appreciate the danger 
of underestimating stuff. Look how much the Biden administration underestimated the strength of the Taliban. And now the Taliban is ravaging Afghanistan. Well, the Fed is making the same mistake in its underestimation of the strength of inflation. And soon inflation will be ravaging the United States. And there isn't anything the Fed could do about it. Because again, if the Fed actually tried to fight inflation, something that it's bluffing it would do if it actually needed to, but you know that it won't because it should be doing it right now and it's not because it's afraid of the consequences. Well, the consequences will be even worse if they wait until inflation is even a bigger monster and then try to combat it. So all of this is just talk. But if Powell really is this ignorant when it comes to economics and inflation, then he is just making the same type of mistake that Biden made. And unfortunately, we're going to suffer the economic consequences of this underestimation of inflation. And in fact, if you listen to the speech, and you can go back and listen to it, there's transcripts online too, if you just want to read what he said. But he blamed all of the price increases that we're seeing now on COVID and on the reopening of the economy. In fact, he went out of his way. He pointed out that there was something very unique about the economic downturn that we experienced in the aftermath of COVID. He mentioned that normally when you have a downturn in the economy, personal income goes down as does personal spending. He pointed out that during this downturn, the reverse actually happened. Incomes went up and spending went up. So people had greater incomes and spent more during the downturn than they did when the economy was on the upswing, which is absurd in and of itself. And Powell pointed this out as if it was some kind of positive factor. It wasn't a positive factor. It was a negative factor. If the economy is weak, people should spend less. Income should decline. That is a healthy development that would have happened but for the interference of the Fed. It's like, you know, if you come down with with a fever, you get sick, it's probably a pretty good idea to stay at home and, and rest in bed and let the fever pass and get better. Well, that's not what we did. We got sick, we got you know this high fever, and instead of resting in bed, we went out and ran a marathon. I mean, that can't possibly be a good thing to do when you're sick and your body needs to rest, but that's exactly what we did. But why did that happen? It happened because the government interfered in the free market And as the economy was contracting due to the fact that so many people were no longer working and they weren't producing goods and services, and so the supply of goods and services was going down, work effort was going down, so income should have come down, spending should have come down. In line with that, that would have been natural and healthy, but what was unhealthy and unnatural is what happened because the U.S. government interfered and spent all this money. The Fed printed the money so that the spending would be possible. And now all of a sudden, all these unemployed people actually had higher incomes than they had when they were working. And of course, when they were working, they were helping to produce goods and services. And when they stopped working, they stopped helping to produce goods and services. So the supply of goods and services went down and demand to buy them went up. That's why prices are going up, but it's inflation. Powell blamed everything on a lack of supply. He mentioned that we had exploding demand and that there wasn't enough supply, that there was bottlenecks and shortages. But the real reason for the supposed bottlenecks and shortages wasn't so much that we had a shortage of goods, but we had a surplus of money. Had the Fed not created all this money so that people could go out and buy stuff, prices wouldn't have gone up. All this demand, which ultimately led to the bottlenecks, was a function of the inflation that was created by the Fed. And so the Fed just thinks all this stuff is going to go away, but it's not because the Fed doesn't stop printing money. The Fed continues to print money. The government continues to shower the economy with stimulus. So why is the inflation going to stop? It's not. So why should the impact inflation has on prices stop? It won't.
Powell just refuses to admit that all this demand that he is looking at, that demand is a function of Fed. It's the Fed printing money. Demand is supposed to come from supply. If we produce more, then we can consume more. That is legitimate demand. Instead, this demand is being created by the Fed. It's being printed into existence and it's not real. And that is the reason that prices are going up. In fact, Powell provided more proof that he doesn't get this concept when he was talking about wages. And he was very happy that wages were going up. And he said, this is a good thing in the economy. We want wages to go up because you know we want workers to earn more. And so this is a positive thing. But Powell doesn't seem to understand the difference between nominal wages and real wages. You see, what's important when it comes to workers is productivity. You want labor productivity to go up because if workers are more productive, that's the only way they can get paid more in real terms. Real wages are important. In fact, it's okay if wages go down as long as the cost of living goes down faster. That is what you have to look at. You have to look at the relationship between what people earn and the cost of living. So even if nominal wages are going down, but the cost of living is going down even faster, that's still an improvement. What we have now is the reverse of that, and it's not an improvement. We do have nominal wages going up, but the cost of living is going up even faster. So while Powell is bragging about the fact that nominal wages are rising, he is ignoring the fact that real wages are falling. And that is negative for the economy. And Powell also pointed out that most of the price gains that we're seeing are in goods because he mentioned that during the pandemic, a lot of people spent less money on services and they spent more money on goods. And so that helped push up the price and also, you know, again, contributing to the bottlenecks as all these container ships were queuing up on the ports. But again, where did this demand come from? It came from the Fed. Absent the Fed, Americans wouldn't have had all this extra money to buy goods. And in fact, a lot of people had even more money because at the same time, the U.S. government was handing out money to people who didn't have jobs and was actually giving them more money than when they had jobs. They also told them they didn't have to pay their rent. So even though consumers had more money to pay rent, they chose not to because their landlords couldn't evict them. And then they spent that money on stuff too. But all the Americans were spending money on stuff that they didn't produce. And so it's no wonder that the price of stuff is going up. And it's not going to stop going up because the Fed is not going to stop doing any of the policies that has caused them to go up. And when you're really going to see prices go up, is A, when businesses finally realize that these price increases aren't transitory. Look at what happened at Campbell's Soup this week. American company, stock is hitting 52-week lows, although it rallied a bit today with the market after making a new 52-week low in the morning. In fact, Campbell's Soup stock actually took out its March of 2020 low, which is a big deal. But the reason that Campbell's Soup ain't looking so good right now is because of rising costs. That's what they reported to shareholders. They missed their earnings because their costs have gone up so much. Well, you got to raise your prices, increase the price of a can of soup. Obviously, that's what they're going to do. Many companies have resisted passing on those price hikes. They're not going to resist much longer. They are going to have no choice but to raise prices. Even if that eats into sales, they need to restore their margins and that is what's going to happen. But what's also going to happen that is gonna put a lot more upward pressure on prices in the future than what we've seen so far in the past is the US dollar. The US dollar is going to really go down. I think this is a good time in the podcast to take a little breath, unclench your jaw, relax your shoulders, and take nice, slow, deep, even breaths. You know, sometimes we all need to take a little time to ourselves, and that's where Calm can help. I've partnered with Calm, the number one mental wellness app, to give you the tools that improve the way you feel. You can clear your head with guided daily meditations, improve your focus with Calm's curated music tracks, and you could drift off to dreamland with Calm's imaginative sleep stories. 
Over 100 million people around the world already use Calm to take care of their minds. Sleep more, stress less, live better with Calm. You know, a lot of my friends have told me that they meditate. In fact, some of them actually swear by it. And it's something that I've never actually tried for myself until now. I decided to give meditation a try and I'm using Calm as my guide. And for my listeners who'd like to join me, Calm is offering a special limited time promotion of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash gold. So go to calm.com, C-A-L-M dot com slash gold to get 40% off unlimited access to Calm's entire library. That's calm.com slash gold. Remember, one of the reasons that we had a rally in the dollar and the dollar index did sell off nicely today, but the main reason that the dollar has been rallying was the anticipation of this hawkish speech that we were supposed to get today. And not only didn't we get a hawkish speech, we got an extremely dovish speech. So the dollar needs to really surrender all those ill-gotten gains. You know, normally you get a buy the rumor, sell the fact, right? If you had a rally in the dollar that was associated with the anticipation of this hawkish speech by Powell, what would normally happen in the market is when you finally get the hawkish speech, that investors anticipated and priced into the market, you get a reversal. Buy the rumor, sell the fact. Well, in this case, the rumor was false because the fact was the opposite of what was rumored. So this should have been an even bigger sell-off in the dollar and an even bigger rally in gold and gold stocks than the one we got today. And I'll talk about that a little bit later in the podcast. For now, I want to stick on the topic of this speech. And in addition to basically dismissing all of the price increases that we're seeing now and experiencing as being transitory, Powell also spent a lot of time rewriting history in lecturing the public as to the mistakes made by prior Federal Reserves in being too trigger happy when it came to fighting inflation that turned out to be transitory, but at the time, The Fed officials feared that it wasn't transitory, and so they moved preemptively, and that ended up being the wrong thing. And Powell said that he doesn't want to risk making that mistake. First of all, none of those prior mistakes, the way Powell described it, happened while the Fed was at zero, right? There isn't a prior period of time where the Fed had interest rates at zero. So even if it turns out, which it's not, But even if it turned out that inflation is actually transitory, even if that's the case, that doesn't justify keeping interest rates at zero. Nothing justifies keeping interest rates at zero except my explanation that the Fed knows if they raise rates, the economy is going to crash. And so they're not raising them. And if they raise them later, it'll crash even harder. So they're never going to raise them. That is the only viable explanation for the Fed's failure to act not the idea that inflation is transitory, because even if it was, that doesn't justify keeping interest rates at 0% now. But more importantly, Powell's history lesson is wrong. He is rewriting history. There is no history of Fed chairmen being too aggressive on fighting inflation. History shows that the opposite is true. They're always too dovish. They're never too tight. The only time we really had tight money was under Paul Volcker. And that's not the policy that Powell is criticizing. In fact, he has praised the policies of Paul Volcker. He's just somehow criticizing everybody else without specifically naming names. The one period in history where Powell did acknowledge that the Fed got it wrong as far as they thought the inflation was transitory and it turned out not to be was during the 1970s. But the most ridiculous part about that admission is what Powell blames the higher inflation on. Powell said that the Fed was correct in assuming inflation was transitory because the big increase in food and energy prices reversed. So you had this big spike up in oil and food, and then at some point, oil prices and food prices started to come down. So supposedly, according to Powell, that 
vindicated the Fed that they were right. But then what happened was that core consumer prices kept going up anyway. Even though food and energy prices started to come down, all the other prices started to go up. And Powell blames that on the public. He said what happened was the public began expecting inflation. And because the public began to expect inflation, we had inflation. In other words, the public basically willed the inflation into existence. The mere fact that the public expected inflation, they ended up delivering on those expectations by raising prices or demanding higher wages. So he blamed it on the public, which of course is nonsense. What Powell didn't want to acknowledge, or maybe he doesn't even understand, is why we actually had really high inflation in the 1970s, because we're going to have even more inflation now, even higher inflation now, for the same reasons. It wasn't the public's fault for the 1970s. It was the Fed's fault. What did the Fed do wrong in the 1960s and the 1970s that contributed to all that inflation? They printed too much money. They printed a bunch of money during the 1960s in order to finance large government deficits. Where'd those deficits come from? Well, they came from Lyndon Johnson, who was implementing his great society programs. Medicare and Medicaid never existed before. Rolled those things out. We launched the war on poverty. We had the Vietnam War. By the way, we lost both those wars. Poverty won the war on poverty. And, you know, we lost Vietnam, but we spent a lot of money losing those wars. We funded the space race, right? We had the Apollo missions. We went to the moon. All this stuff was done with borrowed money and printed money. And then we went off the gold standard. 1971, we defaulted on our promise to redeem Federal Reserve notes in gold to foreign governments who had trusted us and who were holding our notes as reserve. So we did all this stuff. And that's why we had all this inflation. It had nothing to do with what the public expected. They didn't get inflation because they expected it. They got inflation because the Fed created it. And the only reason they expected it was because they were living it. Maybe what some people didn't expect was for Paul Volcker to go medieval on inflation and actually let rates go to 20%. That might have been one of the only things the public didn't expect. And so probably a lot of people in the late 1970s early 80s, expected that high rate of inflation to continue, but it didn't continue because Paul Volcker unexpectedly did the right thing, which is probably the last time anyone at the Fed ever did the right thing. But Powell's revisionist history lesson proves that he doesn't understand the mistakes that the Fed made in the past, which is why he doesn't understand the mistakes that he's making in the present. And the inflation that we are going to experience again in this decade is going to be far worse than what was experienced during the 1970s because the Fed now is making the same mistakes as it did back then, only on a bigger scale. The current Fed is monetizing even larger deficits than the Fed did back then. So even more inflation has to be created now than was created then. And it's happening at a time where the U.S. economy is much more leveraged than it was during the 1960s. I mean, we didn't have anywhere near this degree of leverage. America was still a creditor nation. It wasn't a debtor nation. We had a huge industrial base. We had massive trade surpluses back in the 1970s. We didn't have these huge trade deficits that we have today. The economy is a shadow of what it used to be. It's just a gigantic bubble. We had a real viable economy back then, and we still managed to have the stagflation of the 1970s. So if we had stagflation in the 70s when we had a much stronger economy, imagine what we're going to have now when we have a much weaker economy. We have a much bigger bubble, and the Fed is creating even more inflation now than it did then. Well, now that Powell has declared officially that inflation is not a problem, it's about to become a much bigger problem. In fact, what I think is going to now happen in the market is that the inflation trade that was being unwound up until this morning is now being put back on. In fact, all of the inflation sensitive type stocks from oil stocks to gold stocks had big rallies today, except that the rallies weren't big enough. I still don't think 
markets really understand or appreciate the significance of what happened today. But I think they will. I think we're going to start to see this tightening cycle priced out of the market because it's not going to happen. And even if it does happen, it's going to happen later, not sooner. And it's going to be even more ephemeral because even if the Fed does begin to taper, there's no way it's going to conclude the program before it has to reverse course and increase the size of asset purchases. It is clear that no rate hikes are coming. It is clear that the Fed is not worried about inflation and will not raise interest rates to fight inflation, that it is declaring to be transitory. In fact, the one thing that Powell said he was watching as an indicator of a potential threat was expectations because he falsely blamed the inflation of the 1970s on the public's expectations. He said that the Fed is closely watching expectations now for any sign that inflation may not be transitory, which is clearly a lie. Because if you look at the public's expectations of inflation, they're very high. They've been going up. The only thing is they're not high enough because the Fed is actually going to deliver even more inflation than consumers expect. Even though people expect high inflation, it's going to be even higher. They don't expect enough but they still expect a lot. Expectations are the highest since the early 1980s, I think. And obviously, if Powell is claiming that the Fed is taking its cues from expectations, it's lying about that because expectations of inflation are well north of 2% and the Fed is doing nothing, which again is more proof that no matter what happens, the Fed won't do anything. All they're going to do is talk. As I've been saying since the beginning, they're all bark and no bite when it comes to inflation. And that's why this inflation trade is back on. But investors still have a great opportunity to participate, especially in the gold stock sector. If you look at where gold stocks are, I mean, the GDX was up 3.6% today. GDXJ did a little bit better. It was up 4.7%. But look at where these stocks are relative to where they were at their highs in July. I mean, gold, which was up about 25 bucks today, it closed the week at around $1,817 an ounce. It is only about $20 an ounce below its July high, which is what, about a 1% move that would be required to return the price of gold to the high price from July. Gold stocks would still have to go up about 10% from here to get back to where they were when gold was 1% higher. And what is the sole reason for the big sell-off in gold stocks? It was anticipating today's Jackson Hole speech, which was supposed to be hawkish, which was supposed to unveil the taper. And not only did Powell not even mention the word taper, he delivered one of the most dovish speeches I've ever heard. So the markets got the polar opposite of what they had expected yet barely any of the sell-off in gold stocks has been reversed. Now, ultimately, all of it will be reversed, and these stocks are going to be making new highs. But before that happens, we should be going all in. I mean, if the Fed is going all in on a losing bet that inflation is transitory, we should go all in on the winning bet that it's not transitory, that the Fed is wrong. I mean, that's a smart bet. Everybody says, don't fight the Fed. Well, the Fed is always wrong. I mean, not fighting the Fed means that the Fed is printing money. Well, then you buy stuff because printing money makes stuff go up. So yes, printing a bunch of money is good for the stock market, but not fighting the Fed is not the same thing as acknowledging that the Fed is always wrong. And so if you want to do the smart thing, you want to do the opposite of what the Fed thinks. And if the Fed thinks inflation is transitory, well, then you need to make investments that pay off if inflation is not transitory. Just like the Fed claimed that the subprime market was contained, well, people made a lot of money betting that they were wrong, that the problem wasn't contained. So my advice is that before you see these gold stocks recover ground, they never should have lost because the rumor of a hawkish pal Jackson Hole speech was false. (laughs) It was dovish. So before gold stocks recover all that lost ground, 
get more money invested in that sector. You know, if you've got a position in the Europe Pacific Gold Fund, this is an opportunity to increase the size of that position, assuming that a larger position is appropriate for your portfolio and for your risk tolerance. Same thing if you've got an account, a separately managed account in gold mining stocks, a good time to add funds to that account. In fact, if you don't have any money at all invested in the gold sector, what are you waiting for? Now is a great opportunity to get involved because you still have these stocks on sale based on the anticipation of this hawkish speech that never happened. And more and more people are going to start to realize that the Fed's not going to fight inflation. Remember, that's what I've been saying was the reason that gold was not rallying. Everybody expects the Fed to successfully fight inflation. After listening to today's speech, all of those expectations should have been eliminated. There is no pretense that the Fed is ever going to fight inflation. If they were, they would already be doing it. The reason they're not is because they can't. And when investors figure this out, well, then they're going to be buying gold. They're not buying it now or they haven't been buying it even though inflation is going up, it's because they don't think it'll stay up because they think the Fed is going to push it back down. Well, when they realize the Fed is going to do nothing to push inflation back down, then they're going to realize that the high rates of inflation that they're seeing now are just going to get even higher in the future. And the Fed is going to continue to ignore even higher inflation in the future for the same reason it's ignoring inflation right now, because it can't do anything about inflation now, and it won't be able to do anything about it in the future, because in the future, it will be even less able to fight inflation than it is now, A, because inflation is going to be bigger, but B, because the economy is going to be even more levered up by then. And so fighting inflation will do even more damage in the future than it would to fight it now. And so when that reality finally dawns on investors, gold prices are going to take off. These mining stocks are going to go up much more. And so before that happens, you need to get invested. Again, talk to the representatives at Europe Pacific Capital, Europe Pacific Asset Management. They can help you set your account up. They can help put together an investment program that is best suited for your particular circumstances, or you can do it yourself. You know, you can buy my funds at your discount broker. The key is though, to get started. If you haven't already started, and if you've already started to advance the process while you still have a window of opportunity to do so. In fact, gold stocks weren't the only stocks to rally. All stocks went up. The S&P 500 and the NASDAQ both closing at new all-time record highs, not quite for the Dow or the Russell 2000, but based on what Powell did today, you know, if talking about tapering amounts to a tightening, then tapering the taper talk effectively amounts to an easing. And that's really what Powell did. He effectively eased monetary policy by failing to deliver the hawkish speech everybody anticipated. And so this is going to make all assets go up. I would expect the Dow Jones to hit a record high probably next week and the Russell 2000 would follow soon thereafter. But again, I think you get the biggest bang for the buck ultimately by investing in international stocks because then you get the wind of a falling dollar helping to propel your gains. For a while, a strong dollar was a headwind, and now I expect a much weaker dollar to be a tailwind. But of course, the biggest tailwind of them all will be in the mining stocks. In fact, not only do we have domestic problems that I think are going to be weighing on the economy, weighing on the dollar, but now we have an international crisis. We have the disaster that is going on in Afghanistan that keeps going from bad to worse. I mean, that's one thing about President Donald Trump. And, you know, I have been very critical of Donald Trump when it comes to his economic policy of expanding government, expanding deficits, spending more money on warfare with the Space Force and the military and spending more money on welfare and all that reckless spending and big deficits and all the pressure he put on Powell to print more money. You know, every time Powell was trying to raise rates, uh, the president was bashing him. We need lower rates. We need negative interest rates. We need more QE. That was a disastrous economic policy. President Trump did not deliver on any of the economic promises he made. He didn't make America great again. He didn't tackle our budget deficits. He made them much worse. 
He didn't tackle our trade deficits. He made them much worse. So when it comes to economic policy, he was a disaster. But when it comes to foreign policy, he didn't do a bad job. I mean, we didn't have any major policy, foreign policy errors on his watch, right? We didn't get into any wars. I mean, everything seemed okay. So he did portray an image of strength throughout the world that I think, you know, maybe a lot of people didn't necessarily like Donald Trump, but they feared him. And so uh, things were pretty copacetic uh, internationally during Trump's uh, presidency. And in fact, I'm very confident that the mess that we have in Afghanistan, this would not be happening if Donald Trump had been reelected. I mean, I know a lot of people are talking about the fact that Trump had a deal with the Taliban on when we would get out and the fact that, you know, there wouldn't be any hostility between now and then. And the deal was working. And if Trump was still president, we probably would have had to extend the time that we were going to leave because I don't think the Taliban was actually living up to its end of the bargain. And so I think Trump, had he remained president, we probably would not have pulled out of Afghanistan just yet. So none of this would be happening. And I'm sure if we got to the point where we were going to pull our troops out, Trump would have been responsible enough to have done it in a much more effective manner. He would have gotten our people out. He would have gotten our allies out. Maybe he would have left a force large enough to protect our interests during this process. I don't think he would have been dumb enough to leave all of our military equipment there. So we would have taken that out too, or at a minimum destroyed it rather than allow it to fall into the hands of the Taliban. So all these mistakes were made by Biden. They would not have been made by Trump. In fact, it's kind of pathetic. I was watching the press conference, probably the worst press conference I've ever seen a president do, that maybe that's the last time they're going to let Biden do one. I mean, they may never let him field another question. We'll see, because I think he might have went off the teleprompter or his cue cards, whatever he had, to make the whole thing an even bigger disaster. But it seemed like he was trying to blame some of this on Trump. I mean, even though he was accepting a lot of the blame, personally, he still managed to blame Trump. This has got nothing to do with Trump. This is all Biden and Biden's team, right? Whoever Biden appointed. But the reason I'm even talking about this now is this is a potential huge problem for the United States and its ability to maintain the dollar as the reserve currency, because not only are we flooding the world with dollars, right? Not only are we printing all this money and having these massive deficits, but we're showing the world that we're a paper tiger. I mean, we basically lost a war with the Taliban and now the Taliban owns Afghanistan and they're kicking our butts over there. And we betrayed a lot of the people who trusted us. I mean, we are not portraying America in a way that the world is going to hold us in the same type of esteem that they may have held us in when they thought we were a superpower. It seems pretty clear that we're not, and we're not an economic power either. I mean, it appears that we are because we're spending so much money, but we're only spending the money because we can borrow it. And we're only buying this stuff because the rest of the world makes it and lets us consume it on credit. But all of this, our image being diminished on the global scene is only going to add to these problems. And of course, it's also potentially going to add a lot of political uncertainty. Who knows if Biden is going to remain in the White House? What happens if Harris ends up taking his place? I mean, think about it. What if this policy disaster happened while Trump was president, even though I don't think it would have because he wouldn't have allowed it to happen. But let's say it did. Can you imagine how he would be crucified in the press if this was going on on Trump's watch? Can you imagine all the protests about his incompetence? And this is exactly why we can't have a guy like Trump president. Look at what he ended up doing in Afghanistan. I mean, the only reason that Biden is not having an even harder time is because he's a Democrat. And so it's difficult for the media to attack him, even though it's hard not to. I mean, even the left wing guys in the press, I mean, they know this is a disaster. They can't not know. I mean, this is not rocket science. This is pretty basic stuff. But who knows? I mean, now Biden it is a real political box. Who knows what's going to happen in Afghanistan? How much more money we might end up spending? 
what kind of military intervention now might be required. I mean, all of this uncertainty and potential additional expenditures and global embarrassment is just another factor that is going to weigh on the dollar and yet another reason for the dollar to go down. And as the dollar goes down, that simply accelerates the inflationary process. That is going to put even more upward pressure on prices. And of course, as the dollar goes down and foreign currencies go up, because remember, it's just a seesaw. As the dollar goes down, other currencies have to go up because the dollar's value is simply relative to other fiat currencies. I'm not talking about the dollar's value relative to gold because I think all currencies will be losing value in real terms, which is relative to gold. But relative to one another, some currencies will be gaining value while others are losing it. And in particular, I think the dollar of any major currency has the most to lose. But as the dollar goes down, foreign currencies go up. And now more of the goods that get produced outside the United States stay outside the United States. They never come into the United States. So that means the shortage of goods for Americans to buy is going to get greater and greater and greater as fewer goods get exported to the United States because they end up being consumed outside the United States because local consumers now have a stronger currency to buy those goods. And in fact, look at what's going on with used car prices. A lot of people think, oh, this is just temporary. We're going to see used car prices coming down. This is my prediction on used car prices. I think they've only begun to go up. What I think is going to end up happening to used cars, when the dollar collapses, America's used cars are going to look very inexpensive to people overseas who have appreciated currencies. I mean, our used cars are going to get really cheap compared to the price of new cars. And so what's going to happen is we're going to end up exporting a lot of those used cars. That's going to be, I think, one of America's big export is going to be used cars. And after all, the cost of exporting is not that expensive relative to importing because so many of those ships are leaving empty. Well, pretty soon they're not going to be empty. They're going to be full of used cars because people around the world are going to want those cars because they're going to be very cheap. But at the same time, they're cheap for everybody else. They're going to be getting more and more expensive for Americans. In fact, that's one of the reasons that so many Americans are going to be selling their used cars because they can't afford to drive them anymore because they can't afford the gas or they don't even have a job to go to. So they don't even need a car. So they're going to get whatever money they can by selling the cars to wealthier people in other countries, like China, for example. They don't have anywhere near as many cars as we have. I mean, the average American household probably has at least two cars. The average Chinese household still riding a bike. What's going to happen is the Chinese are going to buy a lot of our cars. So maybe the average American household will go down to just one car. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll start riding more bicycles here as the Chinese drive more cars. But this is a reflection of a declining American standard of living and a rising standard of living in China. You know, the, the irony of it is you, you hear a lot now coming out of China where these Chinese officials are sounding more and more like American politicians. They're talking about how we have to have shared prosperity, how the government has to intervene to make sure that everybody benefits from a growing economy. I mean, you would think these guys had to be reelected. I mean, don't they get it? that it's capitalism that is responsible for the successes that China has enjoyed. It was capitalism that was responsible for America's early success, but we don't have capitalism now. We have socialism and socialism is responsible for our current failures. And so what China should not be emulating is what America is doing now or what it's done recently. It should emulate what America did originally and have faith in a capitalist system. Understand the invisible hand and that a rising tide lifts all boats. We don't need the heavy hand of government to have shared prosperity. The invisible hand of capitalism guarantees that that happens all by itself. (music) 